Thank you for listening to our church podcast, where it is our joy to share helpful truths from the Bible. We pray this serves as one more tool to help develop leaders within our church and community who love and honor Jesus and reveal it by loving others. If you have any questions or comments about any of the messages, we invite you to join us on any Wednesday, 6 p.m., for a group discussion on the passages and sermons found here. Scripture reading this morning will be in Luke 17. If you would please stand, we'll be reading... Verses 11 through 19 of Luke chapter 17. Luke 17, beginning in verse 11, says, On the way to Jerusalem, uh, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a, at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? He said to him, Rise and go your way, your faith has made you well. Uh, Father, we thank you so much for the blessings that you've given us today. Uh, we pray, God, now as we go into our study of your word, uh, that you would give us insight, that you would give us understanding of what it is that the Spirit would have to say to us today. Uh, give us hearts that would be receptive uh, and quick to obey and to heed what your word says. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, today, I'm going to give you uh, two sermons in one. Now, don't get alarmed. We're not going to be here all day. Uh, but two sermons in one this morning. Uh, we're going to first walk through the text as we typically do. And then at the end, I'm going to do something here that I've uh, really not done before since I've been your pastor. We're going to do the opposite of a typical expository sermon. I'll explain that later. First, let's walk through our text, make sure we understand it. Verse 11, uh, Luke tells us on the way to Jerusalem that Jesus was passing between Samaria and Galilee. Now remember, uh, all the way back in chapter 9, Jesus left Galilee. Uh, and he headed toward Jerusalem. You remember that pivotal moment in his ministry when he leaves his home uh, land of, of Galilee in the north of Israel, and he heads down toward Jerusalem in the south of Israel. And these chapters from chapter 9 all the way to chapter 19 in Luke are covering this journey of Jesus from, uh, from Galilee to Jerusalem, where he will uh, eventually be arrested uh, and, and crucified. And so he's headed there. He's headed to Jerusalem. And Luke kind of reminds us of that periodically throughout these chapters so we know where we are. Uh, verse 12, it mentions that he, he's entering a village, uh, some town in between uh, Samaria, Galilee, on his way to Jerusalem. And he meets there 10 lepers who stood at a distance. Now, we've talked about leprosy before, but just to remind you, uh, this is what we call today Hansen's disease. It affects the skin and, uh, and the nervous system. It causes extreme damage. Uh, it is a miserable disease that leads to people hurting themselves without even knowing it because the, uh, the nerve damage in their body is so extreme. Uh, some have been known to reach into a fire to retrieve something and not even uh, think twice about it. And so they end up, you know, they'll walk barefoot on glass and not feel a thing. Uh, and so they just kind of rip apart their body little by little without even realizing it. As their condition worsens, the damage to the skin and nerves spreads throughout the whole body until they eventually die a very miserable death. Uh, not only was leprosy miserable because of the pain and suffering of the disease, but those who had leprosy were also ostracized from the rest of society. They were banished uh, from the cities, from the towns, and had to live outside the city gates in quarantine. They were not allowed to come close to anyone. They were required to wear a, a covering over their face and to call out, unclean, unclean, anytime uh, somebody walked by. And so to be a leper... Really, in the ancient world, not only was a death sentence, but it meant that you were going to spend the rest of your life uh, separated from your family, separated from your friends, separated from society. And so Jesus comes, he sees these 10 lepers, they're at a distance as he's entering the village. Again, they would be camped outside the city gates. And in verse 13, they lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. These 10 lepers call out for healing. No doubt they had heard of Jesus uh, as indicated by the fact that they call him by name. They knew who this was. They'd heard the stories of how Jesus had banished uh, disease and illness throughout Israel. He had healed people. And so they see him coming and they ask him to heal them. And in verse 14, when he saw them, he said, 
Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Showing themselves to the priests was required before they would be declared clean and let back into the city. We're not going to take time uh, to go back to Leviticus, but if you were to read there, uh, you would see the laws regarding leprosy. There were safeguards put in place uh, in case somebody just happened to have a skin rash that looked like leprosy and really wasn't. Uh, that would be a terrible thing, right? To be uh, forced out of the city and, and banished, and then you don't actually have leprosy. Uh, so they had this safeguard put in place that if you had a rash and it was assumed to be leprosy, uh, you would be sent out for a period of time, and then if the if the rash disappeared and you were healed, you could come back to the priest, he would examine you, make sure that you were not contagious, and then send you back into the city. And so he, Jesus is telling them, go to the priest for examination, and as they're on their way there, they are cured of their leprosy. Verse 15, then one of them, remember there's 10 lepers, 10 that were cleansed, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Ten were healed, only one thought to come back and thank Jesus for healing him. And the one who did was a Samaritan. Uh, the Jews hated the Samaritans. They were the half-Jew, half-Gentile race. Uh, they, the Jews looked down on them, thought that they were uh, inferior because they were a mixed race, and they avoided them. And yet here in our text, the one out of the ten that came back and thanked Jesus for healing him was a Samaritan. Jesus responds to this in verse 17. Jesus answered, We're not ten cleansed. Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? He said to him, Rise, go on your way. Your faith has made you well. Now I need to point out uh, two words in particular there in verse 19. First, that last word is sozo in Greek. Uh, and I think the ESV here translates this, this unfortunately. Uh, the word means to save. It's translated it made you whole, uh, implying that it has to do with healing, but I don't think that's the case. Jesus is saying, is talking here about salvation, not merely physical healing. Again, 10 of them were healed. Uh, this one was saved. His faith had saved him. It's the exact word used in Luke 7 when Jesus says to the woman at the Pharisee's house, your sins are forgiven. Uh, then those who were at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Same words in Greek. And so this man's faith had saved him. I think the, the CSB does a very good job, the Christian Standard Bible, of translating verse 19 of our text. It says, uh, get up, go on your way. Your faith has saved you. So you have 10 lepers that were healed, one that was saved. Now we need to be careful because you might be tempted to think here that the one guy was saved because he came back and thanked Jesus uh, for healing him. But notice Jesus did not say, your thankfulness has saved you. He said, your faith has saved you. All 10 had the faith to ask for healing and obey Jesus' instructions, but this one had saving faith. Uh, he saw past the miracle to the reality of who Jesus was and his faith saved him. His thankfulness is merely the evidence of his faith. It's, it's not only the evidence, sorry, it's not the only evidence you see there. In verses 15 and 16, this man praises God. He comes in humility and casts himself down at Jesus' feet in worship. And then he thanks Jesus. Humility, worship, praise, thankfulness. These are all fruits, evidences of the man's conversion to Christ. The rest of the lepers, they just took their healing and they went on their way. No doubt they were thrilled to be cleansed of their leprosy, but there was no heart of worship in them. And doesn't this just show us something about those who have saving faith and those who don't? Uh, many come to Jesus seeking healing. Many come in order to have prayers answered. Uh, we come to God wanting the benefits that he offers, but the heart of a true Christian is more than that. A true Christian who has been saved by God's grace and given a new heart will not just come to God seeking benefits, but will come in worship and humble service to him. If you're in love with what God does for you, that's not saving faith. That's simply loving yourself. But if you truly love God, not just his blessings, but you love him, that is the heart of faith. And this guy had it. His faith had saved him. It was obvious because of the fruit of conversion that was there. Now, that's the end of Sermon 1. Now we're on to Sermon 2. Uh, we're saved by faith. True salvation produces evidences, a heart of thankfulness, to God for what he has done. That's part of that fruit. I hope that's all clear from the text. Uh, now, the rest of this morning, 
I'm going to do the opposite of what I typically do. This is uh, something, by the way, I adapted from a sermon I heard years ago. Honestly, I have no idea who preached it or where I heard it. Uh, but I decided after hearing that, I made a mental note that if I ever preached Luke 17, uh, that I would do this. And so here I am all these years later, and I hit Luke 17. So we're going to do this today. Uh, we're going to do uh, differently than normal. Typically, when I preach, I use one text, and I draw out several points from that text. It's called expository preaching. Uh, we've done some of that already this morning. Now we're going to do the opposite. I'm going to use several texts to demonstrate one point. And that point is this. Ingratitude is a serious sin in the sight of God. Uh, in our text, nine out of the ten lepers who were cleansed just went on their way. They didn't give thanks to Jesus for healing them. And if you're like me, I tend to think, well, that's kind of lame of them. Uh, they should be grateful for what he did for them. Uh, but I don't really see it as much more than just a courtesy, a politeness. But ingratitude is a serious sin in the sight of God. We'll see that as we walk through a few texts in Scripture. First of all, we're going to begin with the first sin in human history. Uh, this may not immediately come to mind as a sin of ingratitude, but I think right at the heart of this, uh, right at the heart of what Eve did in the Garden of Eden, was a lack of gratitude for all that God had provided for her. At Genesis 1, beginning in verse 27, we're told that God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the heavens, to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. In chapter 3, Eve says to the serpent, We may eat of the fruits of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So God had provided them a garden uh, with fruit trees for Adam and Eve. All of the trees on the face of the earth, God said, you can eat from, except this one. God said, don't eat from that tree. You can eat from all the trees and all of the garden, but don't eat that one. And yet Eve was not grateful. She could not be grateful for all, all that God had provided for her. She just had to have that one fruit that was forbidden. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was de uh, to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. After all that God had done for Eve, she disobeyed his one command. God had told her that she could eat freely, from all the other trees, yet she couldn't be satisfied with that as long as there was one that was held back. Such ingratitude towards God, who had given them everything they could ever need. And of course, you know the punishment for this sin changed the course of the world forever. God said to Eve in verse 16, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. You shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. You are dust and to dust you shall return. Then verse 23, Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he replaced the cherubim with a flaming sword that turned everywhere to guard the way of the tree of life. This was the punishment for Eve's sin. Eve was ungrateful, and ingratitude is a serious sin in the sight of God. Uh, next we'll look at Israel in Numbers 11. This is after the exodus from Egypt. Uh, God had led them through the Red Sea. He had killed the Egyptian army that was chasing them, and now God is leading them through the desert to the promised land. And along the way, of course, they need food, they need water, and God provides that for them. You know, the miracle of the manna, uh, where God gives them uh, bread from heaven. I mean, can you imagine? Miracle bread that they got to eat every day. God provided for them throughout their wandering. Yet in verse 4 of Numbers 11, it says, The ramble that was among them had a strong craving, 
The people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt. That cost nothing. Uh, The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up. There is nothing at all but this manna to look at. So they had plenty of food. God provided them everything that they needed. And now they're complaining about the lack of selection. Uh, They're missing the fish and the cucumbers and the melons from back in Egypt. God was providing them with food from heaven, and yet they were still complaining. Verse 10, Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord blazed hotly. Moses was displeased. Verse 18, God says to Moses, Say to the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the hearing of the Lord, saying, Who will give us meat to eat? For it was better for us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat. And you shall eat. You shall not eat just one day or two days or five days or ten days or twenty days, but a whole month until it comes out at your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wept before him saying, why did we come out of Egypt? You can understand, of course, the anger of God. He's delivered them from slavery. Remember, they were enslaved in Egypt and they're saying, I wish we could go back there because we had melons. I mean, what, what ingratitude towards God. So God says, okay, you want meat? I'm going to give you so much meat, you will be sick of it. Uh, Verse 31, we see the meat comes in the form of quail. Uh, A wind from the Lord sprang up, and it brought the quail from the sea and let them fall beside the camp, about a day's journey on this side and a day's journey on the other side around the camp, and about two cubits above the ground. When I was a kid, I used to read that, and I thought it meant the quail were piled up uh, three feet. That's not what it's talking about. They're flying low at about three feet, and so they were able to catch them. God caused this wind to bring the birds over to them in the desert, and the Israelites were able to catch them and eat their meat. Verse 32, the people rose all that day and all night and all the next day, and were and they gathered the quail. Those who gathered least gathered ten homers, and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. While the meat was yet between their teeth, before it was consumed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people. And the Lord struck down the people with a very great plague. Therefore, the name of that place was called Kibroth Hatava, because there they buried the people who had the craving. This was God's judgment against them for their ingratitude. He had saved them from slavery in Egypt. He had provided for them food from heaven, water from a rock. And yet here they are complaining that they had better food while they were slaves in Egypt. The Israelites were ungrateful. And ingratitude is a serious sin. In the sight of God. Next, we're going to look at the story of Joash. Uh, Joash, you remember, was one of the kings of Judah. You can find his story in 2 Chronicles 24. Joash became king in a very unusual situation. Uh, Normally, when the previous king died, the son would then take the throne. That was typically how it went. But in Joash's case, he was just a little boy, around one or two years old, uh, when his father died. And his grandmother was a wicked lady named Athaliah. Uh, Athaliah wanted to be queen, and so when her son died and the throne was vacant, she killed everyone in the royal family so she could take the throne. But there was one boy who escaped, and that was Joash. Little Joash was taken by a man named Jehoiada. Jehoiada and his wife, they took him and hid him away so he wouldn't be killed by his murderous grandmother. Uh, They raised him for the next six years in hiding. And then in year seven, Jehoiada rallied an army together, killed Athaliah, so that Joash would be the rightful, uh, who, who was the rightful heir to the throne, would be able to take, uh, could, could, could become king. Now, Joash was only seven years old at this point. Uh, can you imagine being king at seven years of age? Uh, and yet he was. And so Jehoiada helped him run things for a little bit until he was old enough to really function as king on his own. We'll pick up the story in verse 1 of Second Chronicles 24. Joash was seven years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zabiah of Beersheba. And notice verse 2, Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada, the priest, that man who had taken him in and had uh, raised him and cared for him. He did what was right in God's eyes as long as Jehoiada was alive. But then verse 15, Jehoiada grew old and full of days and died. He was 130 years old at his death. They buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel toward God and toward his house. Now, after the death of Jehoiada, the princes of Judah came and paid homage to the king. This is Joash, and the king listened to them. 
and they abandoned the house of the Lord, the God of their fathers, and served the Asherim and idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this guilt of theirs. Jehoiada dies, and Joash abandons God and begins worshiping idols. God then sends prophets to Joash to warn him to repent. Verse 19, Yet he sent prophets among them to bring them back to the Lord. These testified against them, but they would not pay attention. Joash would not listen to these prophets. Verse 20, Then the Spirit of God clothed Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada the priest. Remember, Jehoiada is the man who raised this boy, who saved his life as a toddler, uh, who raised him in hiding, who gave him the throne. And his son comes to Joash and says, Thus says God, why do you break the commandments of the Lord so that you can, cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, he has forsaken you. This is the son of Jehoiada, Zechariah speaking. He comes to Joash and says, Stop this. Why have you forsaken God? Verse 21. But they conspired against him, and by the command of the king, Joash, they stoned him with stones in the court of the house of the Lord. Joash commanded that this man would be killed. He killed Jehoiada's son. Jehoiada, the one who had kept him from his murderous grandmother as a toddler. Jehoiada, the man who had raised Joash for six years in hiding and then risked his life in order to restore the throne to him. This man who had done so much good for Joash, here Joash kills his son because he's trying to urge him to come back to God. Verse 22, thus Joash the king did not remember the kindness that Jehoiada, Zechariah's father, had shown him, but killed his son. When he was dying, he said, may the Lord see and avenge. At the heart of this wickedness, we're told, was the sin of ingratitude. Joash did not remember the kindness Jehoiada had shown him throughout his life. He was ungrateful to this man who had done so much good for him. And God punished Joash severely for this. Verse 23, at the end of the year, the army of the Syrians came up against Joash and they came to Judah and Jerusalem, destroyed all the princes of the, uh, of the people from among the people and sent all their spoil to the king of Damascus. Through the army of the Syrians, sorry, though the army of the Syrians had come with few men, the Lord delivered into their hand a very great army because Judah had forsaken the Lord, the God of their fathers. Thus they executed judgment on Joash. When they had departed from him, leaving him severely wounded, his servants conspired against him because of the blood of the son of Jehoiada the priest and killed him on his bed. So he died. They buried him in the city of David, but they did not bury him in the tombs of the kings. Joash was ungrateful. And ingratitude is a serious sin in the sight of God. I think many of us underestimate the seriousness of ingratitude. Uh, listen to this list of sins in 2 Timothy. This is, this is a list that describes ungodly people. Paul says, uh, people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Uh, doesn't ungrateful just stick out of, of that list? Uh, you see this list of sinful attitudes and they all seem so terrible. And then right in the middle is ungrateful. In God's eyes, ingratitude is a serious sin. Uh, we see these examples throughout the Bible where God's anger was kindled against ungrateful people. Paul wrote in verse uh, 18 of Romans 1, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. They became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Why is God's wrath poured out in verse 18? Because these wicked people refused to give thanks to God. Ingratitude is a serious sin in the eyes of God. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, none of us do that. None of us live up to that standard, of course, of always giving thanks. But we ought to strive for it. We ought to be people that are characteristically thankful. As we see in our text in Luke 17, uh, thankfulness is one of the evidences of true conversion. And ingratitude is the characteristic of the wicked, according to 
2 Timothy 3. And with all that we have to give thanks to God for, here's one more thing to add to that unending list of blessings. Luke 6, 35, Jesus says, Love your enemies, do good, lend ex expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great. You will be sons of the Most High, for he, speaking of God, is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that God is kind to the ungrateful, uh, because if not, I would have no hope. So often I've been blessed by God and not even recognized it. He's so good to us every day, and we hardly ever notice it unless something is taken away from us, unless something goes wrong in our life, and then we realize how blessed by God we've been. James said in James 1.17, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Every blessing in your life is a gift from God. When was the last time you thanked him? When was the last time you gave thanks to God for your health, for your job, for your family, for your salvation, for the fact that you live here in America? You could have been born in Afghanistan and that God allowed you to live in a place of safety and comfort and prosperity like most of the world only dreams of. Have you thanked him? Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. May we never forget that. Remember the words of Jesus from our text. We're not ten cleansed. Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? May that never be said of us, that we were not found to give praise to God for all of his kindness towards us. We who have received so much from the hand of our good and gracious God ought to be quick to fall at his feet in thankfulness. We hope the message you just heard was helpful to you. It means a lot to us that you would join us for this podcast. For more information about our church and meeting times, visit lbcmiller.com or call us at 219-885-9303. We would love to hear from you.